So, I want to do roll call. Name rank serial number, as they say. Um, so, name the courses, maybe not all the courses, but the courses that you teach, just to kind of differentiate, because I know you guys all do have different little niche things that you each have sort of separate classes that you do. And your sort of industry connection, because I know yours is incredibly unique, but sort of w where your connection is to sort of outside the college in terms of either something still. In this focus yeah, area. Yeah, and it's sort of within this area. So, from left to right. <laughs> I'm Liz Miller, and I teach mobile app development, programming, um, and design. And I came to this um, through programming, oceanography, uh, but I've worked in the mobile app field developing mobile apps for a company that was developing middle school apps to teach students how to create not to create apps, but we were creating the apps so that they could do STEM work. They, they were recording environmental information. And we put together a whole program on that. Cool. I'm Brian Craven. I'm uh, chair of the Computer Media Technology, technology Department here. Uh, and my background is I came from General Electric Company, where I was a software engineer. Um, it was all jet engines. Uh, sometimes I talk to my students about it, and they have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> Uh, but it was I, I, I had a strong, yeah, a strong jet engine background, uh, military background. I'm a veteran, mm -hmm. um, and so at General Electric, I did a lot of work. Um, used to write in Fortran 77. Uh, and did a lot of work in database. Wrote some database apps that were uh, pretty heady stuff. Um, and retired. Took an early retirement from there, and had an opportunity to come here. Came here. And, uh, the game development program, I have responsibility for web and game development here, and uh, web was here. I've uh, revised it, I'm undergoing a third revision, and game development was uh, my idea, and I was given permission to uh, give birth, <laughs> and uh, it's been a lot of work, but for nine years now, we have a strong game development program. Here. Yeah, we definitely, we definitely come back to that. All right, uh, my name is Michael Harris, and I've been teaching here for about a year full time, adjunct since 08. Um, I'm teaching the intro to big data with r, &R Studio mm -hmm. and developed the data management certificate uh, so far. Currently, um, the, or in development, is the second level um, of the big data certificates. Uh, it's going to be a data analytics certificate, mm -hmm. um, and that one's currently in development right now. For industry, I'm actually an engineer by trade, so I worked at uh, Harvard Smithsonian building telescopes for space and iRobot doing uh, robots for the military. Part of my job as an engineer was data analysis. So a lot of times I'm reading all the sensors and getting all of the data in and integrating with the database and analyzing all of that stuff. Um, and when this uh, grant position opened up, I applied for it. Was that because I thought it'd be a really good fit, uh, and I enjoy teaching. Yeah. Um, decided to take the jump from the engineering field into academia. Yeah. So I'm especially glad we have the three of you here because if only just for that, it's the the second part of your resumes where like oceanography, <laughs> jet engines, and telescopes and robots. It's like I don't know. It's like nerd heaven. This <laughs> talk. So, but I, I, and I wanted to start our conversation because uh, you know, as being part of sort of the North, Northeast Resiliency Consortium family, resiliency is sort of the abstract theme of all of everything that we're kind of talking about. So, and I wanted to start with your sort of in the non-teaching realm of your either your history, your lives, or whatever. Is there something about information technology and all its various parts. Again, that's the, again we have such a great swath of, of, of the way information technology is done uh, in the workforce that like, what is it about IT in particular, do you think that lends itself to resiliency in particular? Why is IT, why, does I, why do IT professionals have to be resilient? Because it changes yeah. all yeah. the it time. It changes by the hour. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. The things that we uh, know today, uh, for instance, uh, so in this semester I'm teaching in a um, course I've taught before, but the software company um, called Real Illusion 
changed the software so dramatically that it was back on the learning curve because even though you could do 60% of what you could do before, they've changed the way you do it and they've changed the dynamic of the software. They even changed the location of the icon. They don't want it, you know, where is that move tool now? Yeah. Um, so you constantly have to keep up. You don't get to sit still. Mm -hmm. I, I, and I know Liz and Mike as well, that you know, we spend so many out of here hours trying to figure out what's going on, what are the changes, how do I bring that in the classroom? Because the kids in the classroom will come at you and go, well, I, I said it'll do this, how do you do that? Oh, I didn't know we'd do that. <laughs> is, is that something, I mean, sort of to cheat ahead a little bit too, talk about your students, is, is, are they bringing questions to you yes, from... Sir. Yes. Yeah, so you, you're that much more like, you know, Shakespeare didn't write another play that I didn't, you know, I'm not, yeah. so they're going to be like, oh no, Hamlet part two, yeah. you know, so, yeah. but there's, so they are, so do you Absolutely. have an example of that? Um, I, I have examples with that just with, um, we started out teaching the Android programming one last spring mm -hmm. um, using Eclipse and Android Studio had just become the de facto standard and people were having a lot of trouble with Eclipse and they said, oh, we'll, we'll go to Studio and I'm like, how am I going to support two different IDE yeah. development environments mm -hmm. um, at the same time when things don't work exactly the same? Uh, I guess we'll figure that out. Hey, guess what? That's resiliency. Um, what was your what was the solution? How did the you solution was that when somebody learned something new, in you know, hey, I just figured out how to do this. Mm -hmm. Tell everybody. And so the students teach as much as, as I do in some instances. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, in, in terms of data. Is that yeah. Thing? So for here's a good one. And this was last week. Um, I teach R, which is a statistical software. Mm -hmm. And one of the assignments was a web scraping assignment. It, one of the students I was using had to come up with something um, for their work where they had a list of 2 million VIN numbers. And they had to input the VIN number to a web database. Um, and then they got back things like if it ever had been in an accident, all the Carfax information, they're tabulating everything. Um, she found the software, R Selenium, which is an add-on package to R, mm -hmm. which allows R to control a, a web browser. So it basically allows R to control Firefox or Google. So you can code within R and basically get a token. Um, by clicking a button in your web browser, but you control everything from R. So mm -hmm. you can write a simple, you know, 50-line program to get those 2 million, um, to input the 2 million uh, VIN numbers and get back the information. Sure. Um, first time I had ever seen R Selenium was when she brought it up. So because R has 5,000 different packages, mm -hmm. there's no way that I could know every one of them. Mm -hmm. And constantly, uh, students, are, it, part of the assignments are students have to go out and figure it out for themselves. It's part of the resiliency we build in, mm -hmm. um, which is good for us because we're actually learning more. They usually come back with a package I haven't seen, so I have to sit down and go through the package and learn it and help them along with the package mm -hmm. itself. Um, but yeah, that's it. and in the end, she ended up, it was like a 40, 50 line program that uh, grabbed the two, it was two million, uh, there were two million VIN numbers and about 80 different fields that she created. Um, really cool program. Is there another? Is there an equivalency, Brian, in, in sort of the game from the game side of things? I imagine students would bring in all sorts of things. Oh, absolutely, that. absolutely, uh, and they're out there all the time. And they'll say, "Well, I did this, and so we, we use Maya, Autodesk Maya, mm -hmm. and Maya changes every year now. Uh, the new version every summer." Um, and they'll come in and say, well, I did this in Blender, and it works great in Blender, so why aren't we using Blender? Because I can do that. And, well, we don't have Blender because, we number one, we don't have time to do Blender on top of everything else we do. But let's go see if we can figure out how we can do this in Maya. And sometimes they'll say, oh, no, it's over here. You go click over here, and you do it here. And you're like, I had no idea it was in there. Maya has about 300,000 switches and it's, like it's impossible to know everything. But these kids will find something and they'll bring it in the classroom and say, no, if you do this, it's, it'll work. Yeah. To speak to that sort of, the, again, the nature of, again, what your students are doing. Like, what is it about, again, for, for someone who wouldn't necessarily understand what oh, no, web scraping is or yeah. something like that, that if they're watching this, what is it about, it, there seems to be always a fundamental, like, you kind of just, Again, I'm, maybe I'm not coming up with the right word. It's 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 very scientific, but it's you're always looking for. There's no one solution. That, there isn't one way. So explain no one, explain that right. sort of 
There, that is, that because it's a philosophical yeah. thing. Oh, yeah. right. it's, there, it there is no one way how you do something. Yeah. I want to take an object in a in a, a video game. I want the object to move from point A to point B, but I want it to go by point B and a half on the on the way. Mm -hmm. uh, how do I do that? Well, I'll take a move. I'll set a key. I'll make another move. Set a key, and that works fine. And mm -hmm. somebody else will go. No, I'll write a piece of code, and a piece of code will do. It, and I have more control if I write the code because instead of making it go angular, I can make it go on a radial. And so there's all these different variations. And, and, and so what I teach them is. Whatever works for you is what will work for you. And then you'll go look at and explore other ways. If you are that interested, mm -hmm. don't settle on this being the only way. Go look for that other way to do it and talk to somebody else and listen to other people. By the coming in with that instinct. Right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, that's one of the big things about teaching some of the software that we teach. There's a thousand different ways to get from point A to point B. You have different packages, um, different functions, different calls, uh, and there isn't one set specific way. So the idea is to, the way I design it up is to teach him with, uh, teach teach the lessons openly. So you have to get from point A to point B, but you don't give them what that path is. They have to go out and find that path. Um, and usually they find, you'll have, you know, for 15 different kids, you might have nine or 10 different ways of doing the same right. exact thing. Yeah. And the idea is for them to find what works for them. You know, it's like the same thing with learning. Some people are visual learners, some people are auditory, some people like to like the rope method. So you let the student figure out how they actually can understand the material the best that way, I think. I think in IT, one of the, one of the big fallacies of IT is that it's very rigid and you only do things one way. And I find it one of the most creative fields out there because there are so many different ways to solve a problem. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, and giving the students the freedom to know that, you know, how you do it and how I do it might be completely different. Sorry. As long as you meet the criteria, it's all okay. And a lot of students really start out very nervous about that. They don't they don't trust yeah. you. Mm -hmm. uh, as the instructor, you know, there's gotta be a catch here somewhere. Um, yeah. and because because all the way through high school you're taught you do it this way. You know, you go to your math class, your physics class or whatever, you do it this way and you only do it this way. This is the only way to do it. Well it turn you know, they get to college and all of a sudden it's like, oh well, you know, there's about four diff four or five hundred different ways to do this to solve this problem. What do you think? What do you think might be a good approach? And sometimes they, they go the wrong way and you, you guide them back and sometimes you go, oh, I never thought about doing it that way. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. and, and then they go, really? You know? <laughs> and, and, <laughs> but that gives them a strength. And, a, and again, it, it's part of the resiliency piece, but it gives them a strength to have faith in their own ability. That it's not just something that, that I've learned as a formula. Yeah. That they've got the strength to figure it out. Are they coming with any computer? Are they coming in with that any computer science? Are, is computer science their life outside of school? Because you mentioned math, physics, so you sort of the sort of wrote high school classes. Is is are you guys their first exposure to this outside of what they may have been doing? You know, from four o'clock to midnight or two a.m. on their own. Um, I, sometimes now for the big data, um, it's kind of an interesting field. So I've been getting a lot of people from industry back into okay. the course. So. It, for those people, no, you know they're out right. working. They're out working, but there's also a section of the of the class where it's it's an entry level class. So you're getting people where this is probably not their first, but maybe their second exposure um, to the IT field. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that, it, and as Liz mentioned, what she tries to do and Brian does as well, is when you give an assignment that doesn't say you have to go step A, step B, step C, step D, that hand-holding type assignment, mm -hmm. students have a hard time at first. They don't know what to do. Because, well, what do you mean? How I'm supposed to, I don't, I don't understand. You want me to get from here to here? Yeah, you figure it out. And what I try and tell them is when you go to an office environment, you go, your boss gives you an assignment, your boss doesn't say, here, do this, and you have to follow these 15 steps to do so. It says, here, do this, get it done. So trying to prepare them for the real world by giving them assignments similar to how their boss would, would give them. At first, they really have a hard time. By the end of the semester, they're actually doing really well on it. Because your boss, their boss doesn't know how to do it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. He, just, exactly. He, wants to really, but yep. he, he can't give you the instructions. He doesn't know how, she can't give you the instructions. They don't yep. know how to do it. Yep. Exactly. And so 
my students would do that and they'll say, well, what, what should this look like? And I'll go, I don't know. What should it look like? What's it, what do you see in your head? What does a cube look like in your head? We all know the definition of a cube. You can see many pictures of it. But how do you define a cube? What does it look like to you? Is it shiny? Is it you know dull? What do you do? What do you want to put texture on it? Do you want it to move? You want to figure it out. Your client is going to have expectations. Your client is not going to say, oh, I want you to do this and this and this and this. The client is going to say, I need a scene with some robots running around. What are you <laughs> yeah. going to do? What's a robot look like? Are you, do you find that as instructors, are you, are you trying to mimic the client and the boss at the same time? Or like, where, do, where do you, does it depend on the, the type of assignment it is? I do. Yeah, I do. I, Especially I, on the website. I, I, yeah. I mimic the client. And I tell them right up front, I go, you're eventually going to be working for a client. You're only here for a couple of years. You're someplace else for a couple of years, and then you're out there and you're working for someone. They don't know how to do this stuff. Right. They're paying you good money to do it. So, for the purposes of you being here, I'm your client. And if I don't like what you have, I don't like what you have. <laughs> you can argue all day long with me, but if I don't like it, I don't like it. And if I don't like it, I'm not going to pay you for it. One of the big problems in, in computer, the computer science end of IT, um, and I've run into it in the field and our employers come back to us all the time because our students generally don't do this, um, is, is the idea that a, you're given a problem and you go off in a cave and you come back six weeks later, here's your answer. Yeah. Uh, great. That's <laughs> fabulous. And the client looks at it and goes, that's not what I wanted. Yeah. And that happens in the real world all the time because that's the way IT people are trained. Go and solve this problem and come back. So we make sure that there's a lot of check-ins that, you know, and I'll look at it and go, that's not what I asked for. And the idea is for the students to come back and start asking you the questions. When you say this, do you really mean this? Or I'm thinking about this. And they actually have to come back with a lot more check-in points than one would normally expect in a course uh, to say, Yes. No. That's that's not quite what I wanted. I really didn't like that shade of pink or whatever. <laughs> so, what for, what what form of those check-ins? What form do those check-ins take? Is it sort of sitting down with you one on one? Is it are you it's sort of a team thing? Like what? It depends on the project. It depends on the okay. on the piece. Could be an individual review. Could be yeah. peer review. I'll put it up on the screen and say, "Hey guys, what do you think?" <laughs> Gonna show everybody. Put you, on. Yeah. What do you think? Here's, you know? here's the dirty laundry. You know? Yeah. No. Absolutely. This is a, this is a site for. Uh, not not to minimize, but you know, this is a site maybe for the Cancer Society, mm -hmm. and you've got lime green and black uh, background. Oh, yeah. Well, how do you think that's so going energy to work? drink? It's yeah. great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is yeah. This is exactly. this is Joe's truck stop, and you're using pink. You know, you, yeah. you got to yeah. think this stuff through. There's there's the technical value and there's the aesthetic value, especially when you're dealing with web content and web presentation. Yeah, no, that's. I think that's what's excite. What uh, why I'm so excited about what you guys are doing is because there is, for again, that's that that stigma that well, if the program runs, you get an A. If it doesn't run, go back and fix it. That right. like that's not how. It, it's not that machine like that. Right. There is this yeah. incredibly creative and live and very human yeah. activity. Like, can you? Uh, I kind of like to go kind of around the horn here and sort of like, is there like. Kind of walk us through an example of, if you could, I mean, so as much detail as you sure. could uh, do in terms of uh, like a project that has that kind of either check-in system in it and that sort of stumble and fall kind of aspect and you kind of get to the end. It's sort of yep. the, that, that kind of thing. Yeah, um, sure. sure. Um, the last project, the web, uh, different web scraping one we did uh, mm -hmm. with the air class, um, there's probably about 10 or 12 different hurdles they have to overcome in order to get the program to work. And you set all and, those hurdles for Yeah, them. absolutely. Yeah, okay. They're specifically put, they're designed into the program where if they just use the stuff that I teach on the board, it's not going to work. So they have to figure out this stuff for themselves. So mm -hmm. I, I let them know, it's a two to three week assignment, so mm -hmm. I let them know this is going to take you guys probably between 16 and 20 hours to accomplish. So get started now. Is that a norm? And Breaking things down into hours? That one. Like that? that one's long. That one's like I said. It's two. I, it, it used to be two weeks, and I ended up pushing it out to three weeks um, because I realized I was actually asking too much of the students then. Mm -hmm. um, but the way we do it is when the student runs into a hurdle, they'll send me off an email, 
and then I'll look at their code and I'll ask them what they're trying to do in their code. And usually it's syntax errors or something something like that. But sometimes it's the logic's actually not correct. So I'll, I'll kind of steer them correctly in terms of the logic. Mm -hmm. I'll help them out with the syntax and then they'll hit another roadblock and then they'll send me off an email. Um, I usually go through, it in, for that one assignment, I probably went through 60 emails from the students, huh. but it worked well because at the end, um, there's nine students in the class right now and seven of them actually had the program completely functioning, worked well. Um, the other two were probably about 80% there. Okay. Um, so yeah, it, it's the program, the, the, the things are, Assignments are specifically set up to have those hurdles in place. I know the roadblocks are going to hit. Um, I know where the gap is and what I taught them. I, I'll purposely leave a specific. That's my question. Yeah, are you I'll, leaving? I'll purposely those? leave okay. the specific hole in there mm -hmm. where they're going to have to find a way to bridge that gap. Um, yeah. That's is there is there. No, a, I, I do with some of Where's your pot? Where are your potholes? Where the. <laughs> Well, I build them in because we do a lot of scripting. We do it on the web and we do it in uh, gaming program. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll start them off in scripting and get them to understand that you know you may think syntax errors are terrible, but they're the, they're the easiest thing to fix because you've got an interpreter telling you there's a problem on line twenty. Right. A, but, but there's a bigger problem because when you go and to you line, stroke this out of when you're saying when you yeah. syntax, you're really almost like talking like a sentence. Like yeah, I'm missing semicolon or something. Right. right. Yep. Except you go look at line twenty. There's nothing on line twenty, <laughs> so now you got to go look say, yeah. somewhere before line twenty. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but then we get into the logic side of the house, and I try to get them to develop their sense of logic. So you all have a sense of logic, but I can't see your logic. Logic and you can't necessarily see my logic. I don't have your brain, you don't have my brain, but you have to figure this out. So how will you approach it? Why do you always get in the passenger side of your automobile? I don't know, but can you make that work for you? Yes, you just slide over. Maybe that's a bigger, uh, an, an extra step than just opening the driver's side door. But if you take that extra step and you have it in the right sequence, it'll still work for you. And then you go figure out how to string with it. So yeah, I do things and I'll say, say, you know, you need to do this. I, last week I gave them an assignment to make a, a chain, a link chain, have a link chain and have it fall down and swing through gravity and that, and that type of force. And so they had to go figure out how to do that. And they said, well, how do we assign this stuff? I said, well, you know how to do it mechanically. Now you need to do it with scripts. You have to figure out how do you say it in Maya? And it's, it's, I mean, again, maybe I'm biased and you're, you're, I'm listening to this with humanity's ears, but that's exactly the kinds of, that's like, how do you, here's a poem, how are you going to perform this in dance? Like, it's just, yes. that's exactly the same, mm -hmm. you're choreographing something and it just happens to be in lines of keystrokes. It's from, lines of know, code. Yeah. That's and, and the code, so it, it has to be syntactically correct mm -hmm. and it has to be logically correct. I heard three you get nothing or whatever you get isn't doing what it's supposed to be doing. Is you and, and you find students, do, are students amenable to this sort of find your logic journey? I mean, is that, <laughs> it's like, are, are, do you still have arms like, just tell me, just tell That's me what to do. That's a subjective word. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I, th I think it, it, they learn to trust the system. That they learn and, and I think that, I think all of us give projects that are bigger than the students think that they can handle. Yes, and then the students handle it, and that's you know yeah. as, as I always say, you know, back to the gaming stuff. It's the epic win, you know, yeah. when they when they yeah. solve the problem, they are so yeah. pumped, mm -hmm. and it's like, yeah, I knew you could do that. And they're like, how did you know we could do that? Because you've got all the pieces. You just have to put them together in the right order and make it work. Um, and what I do is is in all the mobile app courses, they decide, and we do it early, up front. Your your idea, you have to pitch your idea, you have to, and you're making your app. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to tell you right now that your app is going to be way bigger than what you can finish in the semester. Mm -hmm. But we talk about minimum viable product. We do videos on that. We do all sorts of things about what is the least you, you can get away with, basically, before and still impress me and still make it work. Because if you can't do your minimum viable product very quickly, you can't possibly make a working anything, a game or anything else. It just doesn't work. And so is this going to make sense? Does your structure make sense? Does your logic make sense? Does your interface make sense? Do all of these things 
work. I don't care if you've got the interface and you've got two out of three pieces working at the end of the semester because you can't figure out how to make that button work, mm -hmm. but the rest of it's working. That's great. Yeah. So that's you've not, learned a that, lot. That's not going to affect. I mean, uh, I mean, I, I wouldn't yeah, bring they, down the grades, but like that's like. Uh, if a part of an app, like you said, it's oh, three quarters. Oh, and, and that's very, and it's a very different approach and a very different philosophy. Yeah, but that's what it's I mean, what have you really learned over the course of this? This you started out not knowing the first thing about how to turn, do much more than turn on your phone. <laughs> really, yeah, true yeah. story. Yeah. People will sit in the inner class. Really, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, fortunately, we get rid of the ones very quickly that say what is the operating system. So we we, we sort of we put in some prerequisites to okay, make sure yeah. that we don't have that anymore. Yeah. Um, but but they literally that's what they've only played the games they've never made the games or they've only pl used an app and they've never made an app they've never done any of that so by the end of the semester they're making an app that's a win yeah you know, it may not be perfect they know what they need to do to get it to be perfect it, it's a win that because a lot of my students come in and are the 18 to 20 year old and they come in thinking when do we stop blowing things up right yeah and, yeah you know, <laughs> We right. may get there, but it won't be today. Yeah. Uh, but it's also, I get them to understand that you can go through here, you can go to four-year school, you can get your master's degree. You may never work in a game company. You may go work for Pixar. All that 3D animation in Hollywood and television, advertising, wherever you see it, it's all, and it's not all cartoonish. If uh, there's an Omega Watch commercial I show them, that's absolutely brilliant. Absolutely, whoever did it, a magnificent job. Mm -hmm. And it's just, I said, look at this. Whoever did this got paid an awful lot of money. Where's the game? There's no game here. But whoever did it is living a good life. <laughs> <laughs> so how did, do you do, do you redefine game? Is that kind of part of that particular class? I mean, I'm kind of picking a game and leaving web development behind. But... I redefine the skill. I redefine the purpose of the skill, that it isn't just for gaming, it is for simulations. I can make anything in the world appear to be extremely real and yet have it be ethereal. Yeah. I can take any creature, we now, in the fall, I'm in the spring, I think it's spring now, um, <laughs> I'm gonna be disappointed when it snows. <laughs> uh, we're introducing a, a piece of software though we have in here called real flow and it's all liquids 3d liquids how to make uh -huh. liquids realistic liquids that you see in hollywood movies sure. you see in television commercials mm -hmm. you'll see a human character but they're filled with water and mint leaves and that kind of stuff mm -hmm. these people are making a lot of money doing this stuff guys you need to rethink the industry and gamification especially in education is going to become a bigger field than games because I can teach you history by making it game-like because I'll get your interest up. And once you're interested, you might really want to know what was all the big hoopla about Richard Nixon? I'm dating myself. <laughs> what was all the hoopla about Richard Nixon? Well, you should know that. It's history. Does it affect your life today? Maybe not directly, but it affects your ability. And I use the term all the time with my students say, you can have book knowledge, you can have web knowledge, but you need to have water cooler knowledge. And they don't what is that? Water cool knowledge. I said, that's when you're getting a cup of coffee and somebody comes up and says, what is this thing called, uh, you know, a, a widget in a game? What are, what are you talking about? What is that? And if you can answer that question, that might be the vice president of the company. And you don't know it. They might go, that guy knows what he's doing. Yeah. So you need water cool knowledge. You need to be able to talk about the world, your, your specific career, but the rest of the world goes with it. You can't just live in a box. Yeah. My, what's the data? What's the data of that sort of? You're not like that sort of. You're not making games. You're making simulation. Is there is there yeah. any equivalency in your um, for the data sets we use? Yeah. We try and use real data sets. Okay. So uh, City of Boston actually has all of their data online. So mm -hmm. data dot city of Boston dot gov. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things, one of the assignments is students have to go online and go through the city budget of Boston. And they, oh, no kidding. Wow. Oh, and they have to, oh. they have to come up with five questions. And I don't care what the questions are. They have to go through the data and f figure out five questions that they want to answer. Mm -hmm. And some of them are really good. Why does this charter school get $750,000 for 
books and miscellaneous supplies over five years when the other equivalent charter school gets $25,000. So a lot of curse words involved in those <laughs> questions, I imagine. <laughs> uh, so it, it, it's using using the open data that's mm -hmm. around and trying to get the students interested in the field and showing them the power of being able to look at the data sets. Mm -hmm. um, and it, another one we do it's basically going through Boston's payroll. So we go through the payroll for the city of Boston, and you look at what the top. 250 people make in Boston and you figure out what departments they are. Yeah. So you can ask the question, why does this department have 90% of the people making over $200,000? Mm -hmm. And then the questions are, well, what do we do now? Well, you elect the officials. Why don't you start talking to the officials about it? Um, and trying to create an awareness about what's going on in their lives and what's going on around them, but giving them the tools to where they can actually go to the website and start looking at things and start questioning things. Yeah, and question with factual knowledge. Absolutely. Don't just question, don't oh, just no, go, that's yeah, the whole yeah, everybody's a crook. No. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Do, do you find your students come back with, they're like, I can't look at my phone the same way or I can't, I can't go on, you know, can't go online anymore without noticing? Yeah, I mean, they, they start to notice more. Yeah. I, I watch television, notice where the 3D is in that commercial or in that mm -hmm. movie. It's obvious in something like, um, I can't remember the name of the movie. Um, yeah. What was that movie Cameron did? With the, the, the blue, blue thing. The blue oh, thing. Avatar. Avatar. Avatar, thank yeah. you. I can't yeah. remember the name. Yeah. I said, Avatar was done with Maya. It's the same product that's in front of you that you're using. That movie was done with Maya. So when you watch that movie, look at some of the stuff you see and see if you can recognize, I could probably do that. And you look at a commercial and you see something, you say, you could probably do that. Yeah, I mean, is, has there been a, you know... They, they, look, they tend to look at apps and go, I can do that better. And that's one of their assignments, mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. if you're going to create an app or take an app, if you, if you don't think you can create it, but, but pick an app, an idea that you've got, and they have to do the research. And then what else is out in the, in the, um, in the wild? What, what's in the iOS market? What's in the um, Android market? Why is your idea better? What is the one thing that makes your idea the one that people are going to download as opposed to the other one. Mm -hmm. And they really have to think about what what differentiates it. Um, you know, I have one student come up with an idea that is absolutely brilliant um, in terms of what it does. And basically it's, I've been stopped by the police. And what it does is it sends a message to three people, I've been stopped by the police. Mm -hmm. And then you check in, you just periodically check in because if the police take your phone, you're not checking in. Mm -hmm. And so it's given the geolocation of where they were stopped by the police because people tend to get sucked into the system and nobody knows they're there. And if nobody knows they're there, then you have people. And, and she was specifically, it was a specific thing that happened where somebody killed themselves in jail because nobody knew they were there. And so this is her idea to, to solve that and she went out to she said okay there's companion which you know I'm going home and it will follow you home there's this there's that but this is specifically for this and it's okay if the phone because it sends a message right away in the geolocation tag it gets it out to the people that you need to know that you're in trouble yeah, let's talk pedagogy then. How do you capture those whys? Like, I think all three of you have mentioned sort of like, okay, why? That sort of like you come back at a student who has either discovered a problem or, like you said, like looking at a, a commercial and saying, okay, how, maybe more how, more so than why. But is there, what specific, just even just one, you know, even no matter how big or small, uh, 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 something that you've, you've done in your classroom or in a project or how you framed a project that gets, that captures that. What you're what you're talking about specifically, where it's like, all right, you're going to make something better, you know? How do you, you know, like instead of just making a machine, you're not make, asking them to make a machine; you're asking them to ask a new question, you know? Is that am I am I is that the kind of? It's the reflect. Yeah. It's the reflective it's the, piece. It's, it's the, the reflective, yeah. self-aware thing. How well, are you? Getting I think. That? I think when you ask that question, yeah. you know, how is it better? What are you trying to solve? What is the problem? What's the background information of that? If you ask that question, how did you get from point? You know, why do you want to make a new fashion app, mm -hmm. or why do you want to make a new education app? You know, I mean, I've had students respond, "Well, I'm trying to teach my kid this, and 
I don't like any of the stuff that's out there mm-hmm. because I don't think it really reinforces the things that my kid is, you know, so it's sometimes, it's often very personal. Mm-hmm. It's and, often very personal. And is that oral communication Absolutely. or is that written or is that oh, written? It's like, a little bit of both. It, okay. depends on, it depends on the course. It depends on how things are going. Mm-hmm. Um, but I like, I always do um, elevator pitches. And, okay, that's what, you know, that's the good So they'll, you know, they have to get up in front of everybody and say, this is what I'm designing and this is why I'm designing it. And they've got three minutes to get that done. And I sit there with the stopwatch. One and of my favorite things to I do. Say, <laughs> yeah. I say, okay, from the audience, three questions. Yeah. And so they don't, yeah. they can't be fully prepared for that. And that's where, where that, that Yeah, you know, so is, is, there, is there something like that? For, it, for it, well, in gaming right now with the, the, the initial class, the essentials class, I have them, they have to come up with a game idea and they have to de- develop the idea, develop the character. Give me an idea, what does that character look like? And then I, they get into this and I start to show them episodes of the Sharks. And so eventually you're gonna need some money and this is what you're gonna be up against. These people are real. They really wanna get some money from these billionaires who could give them money without, but look at what they do to them and look at how they question. Do you know your numbers? What am I gonna get back? so on and so forth, blah, blah, blah. Because you all think, I've got an idea, I'm gonna make a game. Well, you need people, you need computers, you need some place you can turn the Space lights on, on. Yeah. you need all of this, and so where will you get that? Because your job at Walmart's not gonna support that, so you have to go borrow, you have to invest, and when you invest, people want some money back, and they want it back in a certain period of time. So I showed them these episodes, and they're all like dumbfounded. Well, oh, I didn't know you went through this stuff. Like, what do you think you're gonna get the money? So you're doing your actually that's an economics lesson yeah. kind of embedded into well it, it's it's economics it's project management it's the financial aspect of it you know I just had him do an exercise you need some computers to develop games what computers do you need you come back with three models because number one you're not going to get the most expensive one right. and maybe the low end one is not good enough and yeah. you know I want or you may have a little bit you may have a little bit con- lowest bid contract if it's for the public but then right. you have to sell me on your idea you have to sell me as to why you need this and yeah same thing I'll ask questions I'll open up to the class I'll ask them questions yeah so it's, yeah. it's kind of a specific thing for you Mike yeah, yeah so and partially part of what the course I try and teach is that data doesn't lie people do so I try <laughs> and get them through that's, that's psychology absolutely <laughs> yeah. um, the, the first assignment I give in the class actually isn't a data assignment I call it a BS assignment that's literally what it's called the BS assignment <laughs> okay. they have to go to the internet Find something that's not true. Oh, God, I know. Find something that's a lie on the internet. And, and <laughs> they so have to explain. The it must be true. They have, to, they have to explain why it's important that they know what the truth is. Um, and there's there, there's a person in the springtime who did the assignment and nailed it. Um, he grabbed something from, uh, it was like The Onion. It's the Daily Current. It's a mm-hmm. satire website. Mm-hmm. The chief of police in Annapolis, Maryland. Um was going before the Maryland State Senate in terms of marijuana legalization. So what does he do? He grabs something from the Daily Current that says 200 people have overdosed on marijuana and 5,000 are in the hospital right now. And he put that before the state Senate. (laughs) And this is, I I didn't even know about one of my students brought it up to me. And and he got the gist of the assignment. And it's understanding when you see something that isn't true and then why do you know it isn't true in doing the fact checking to find out? So a lot of times, you know, I'll, I'll find the articles on Snopes, you know, was Obama a Kenyan Muslim? Um, and then they'll go to Snopes and have a picture of his birth certificate or something. But they'll explain why it isn't true. Um, and the, what I try and drill into their head is the answers in the data. So if you can dig in the data, the data will tell you the truth. Um, but if you listen to people, people will tell you what their opinion is, and they'll try and they'll try and sway what your opinion is to agree with them. Mm-hmm. So the idea is to remove those biases and to look at the data. A really quick example: uh, the uh, second assignment I get is on Deflategate, um, the Patriots Deflategate. Right. Yep. Yep. So what I do in Deflategate is I go up and I give my pitch about what I think is going on in Deflategate, and they have to come up with. The answer, I'm wearing my Patriots cap. <laughs> so part of the assignment is for them to understand that I actually have my own bias and my own framing I'm pushing onto them. Um, and to understand that just because I'm a professor doesn't mean that I don't have a bias as well. So to have them start questioning me too. 
Um, so it, it kind of all wraps into that self-awareness um, piece where I want them to be aware of all the all the info that they're receiving because they receive information in these five minute segments from everywhere and to be aware that a lot of that isn't true and to start to learn that critical skill of discerning um, what that BS is that they're being slumped um, and to look at the data and basically to fact check and find that information out. Um, in terms of, uh, that brings to mind sort of the client practice thing where um, do you find a, a good portion of what you do is kind of play acting or role playing in terms of like, you know, like you put yeah. obstacles and don't yep. tell them about yeah. it. You're, you have a lesson in bias. You meant, you know, like, is there, you know, what, what kinds of choices are you making again as sort of very creative instructors that sort of, that mimic that sort of difficulty again, that's, there's kind yeah. of, I, I just want to kind of go around and see like, if there is that I'm going to be a difficult person things that you're doing in the Good class. Cop, bad cop. Yes, it's the same. You're, are you going to come into that room and slam on the desk and put the light in their face? You know, what, what's that thing that you do that you, you know you're doing something to kind of completely or push them off of their center? I will deliberately, uh, and I'll do it, I'll give them a, a verbal assignment on web development. I'll say, okay, I want you to develop this site. And they'll come back with, you know, what they've created. And I'll look at it and go, but that's not what I asked for. Well, yes, it is, but no, that isn't what I asked for. And I, and so I deliberately play that role, and then I explain to them, you know, if you have a software specification, you have it in writing, and if you create the, the specification, you're covered. If oh. you leave it to interpretation, I guarantee you what I said isn't what you heard, and what you heard isn't what I said. Mm -hmm. Even if it is what I said, come Monday. Well, no, my a, a lot of a lot has happened over the weekend, and you know, gee, I didn't. I, I said I wanted a, a light, a light green screen. You give me a light blue screen. It's mm -hmm. not what I wanted. Yeah, you said light blue. No, I said light green. I said, <laughs> I said, you all live with someone. You've had these conversations <laughs> a million yeah. times. If you have a roommate yeah. of any yeah. variety. Yeah. It's not what I said. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> I said, if it's in writing, it's all. I gave him an exercise last week. I actually gave him a software specification for one of their final projects. I said, this is what I want. A student came back and said, well, you said this. I said, no, what I said in that specification is the only thing that matters. What you think I might have said, I didn't say it. If it's not there, I didn't say it. Mm -hmm. Liz, do you have a, a bad it's cop story? I really try hard not to be the bad guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, not the bad cop explicitly, but um, be different. But, like, yeah, play but role. often it's it's not really playing a role, but it's it's just sort of the reality of the situation. Mm -hmm. And especially in mobile apps, the course I'm teaching this semester teaches they start out doing App Inventor, which is a drag and drop software. Mm -hmm. Then they go into real software mm -hmm. for Android, and then we go over to Swift for Mac and iOS, creating Apple device things, and then we go into Windows. Um, well, by the time we got there, the the room that we had already changed rooms twice, <laughs> and the room that we were in no longer had room on the servers to download the software, because the software keeps changing, and so what we tried, what we started with wasn't working for what we ended up with. Um, so it become, it's more that level <coughs> of okay. change it's still change. It's still, you know, and I do a lot of what Brian does in terms of, you know, sometimes I'll be very loose. Yeah, just whatever, do that. No, that isn't what I asked for. Um, and other times it's very specific. Your project must include, and they'll come back to me. Well, if I put in this extra credit piece, do I have to have this other piece? I'm like, well, you'll still end up, you won't get extra credit because, you know, so you're, because you're missing that. It might fill in that hole, but you're missing that piece. So, yeah, that's, that's the way that works. Well, let's talk about the opposite kind of thing where you are leaving the students to converse and work problems out with one another only and that you are maybe more mute or mum and kind of leave them to their own devices. Is there... Yeah, um, <laughs> always on the group projects, you always have, this person hasn't done a damn thing right. um, all the time. And the first question I always have, well, what have you said to them? Well, I haven't said anything. Okay, so the person hasn't done anything and you haven't done anything either because you haven't, and you haven't actually talked to the person and tried to create the dialogue. So trying to solve those conflicts by giving them um, kind of leading them towards creating that dialogue mm -hmm. and getting them to pick up the phone, shoot off a text, talk to the person, shoot off an email, make sure you get in touch with them. 
Um, maybe the person didn't get the email. Maybe the text got buried and they don't check their text and they have 500 and they didn't notice the 501 that's on there. Making sure that you got in touch with the person and actually had that dialogue just because the person didn't um, meet with you, something could have come up. And trying to get the students to look at it differently rather than just saying, okay, this person, I, I don't want to work with them anymore, trying to force them to work with the people. Um, one of the big things it, it, I always tell them is you're going to be working with people you don't want to work with. Your boss is going to ask you something he doesn't want, you don't want to do. You think your boss is crazy and you're going to have to do it. Um, so it, especially in the group projects, I purposely try and pick things to make people uncomfortable. Um, it, it, this wasn't in the data class. It was in another class, but this was the time of the Ferguson last, last spring, I think last spring, last fall. And what I ended up doing was I found out what pe what side people were on in the Ferguson. So how did you do that? Um, a class poll. So I went around and I literally talked to people. Well, what side? What, oh, okay. Yeah. And literally, it, we had a discussion about it was during a PowerPoint presentation. We we're talking about a presentation. I found out what the side the students were on, mm -hmm. and their presentation they had to defend the other side. Nice. So they had to purposely do something that they were not comfortable with. Um, it were interesting presentations. Some people completely copped out and said, well, I don't, I can't understand why this happened because of this one law and just kind of stuck to the law, just completely copping out that way. But for the most part, um, I did a poll before and after, like just a little questionnaire. And people came from this polarizing side to, not, not in the middle, but they started to change their opinions. So challenging them in terms of what their own beliefs are and trying to force them to do something that they don't want to do. Um, they, yeah, that's my bad cop. They don't like that assignment. Yeah, that's um, so awesome. Right, yeah, <laughs> right but, now, and right, right now, um, the assignment now is they have to come up with a pro-guns assignment. So it, it, I said it's easy. It's easy to say, yeah, the gun laws are ridiculous because look at how many people are getting killed. You have to come up with why the gun laws are okay. So that that's the harder assignment to do. And right now I'm the bad teacher, but um, I like the fact that I'm challenging them to look at what their opinions are and their beliefs and to look at things from the other side. Yeah, and I, I think that has a direct, that's the, the not expect, that's beyond workforce things. That's yeah. like human, th like sort of talking and making, ask, you know, I actually changing someone's mind or bringing them to some sort of middle Middle place where they can actually be ambivalent in a positive sense exactly, that they yeah. can they can that they have an under a complete understanding of a difficult issue. Yeah, you know, is, is there is there something? I mean, not maybe not no, as civically minded, but certainly. But I well, I, in their team exercise, so in this essential course, where they're, they're developing their game as a team project, right? And so I will observe the teams. I'll go around and talk to the teams, and you know, and I'll point out, I'll go, you don't seem to be saying a lot. And eventually, you know, if somebody's not contributing, I'll go, guys, I want you to recognize that if you're doing this out there and you're not contributing, someone is going to go speak to management about it uh, because it needs to be resolved. I said, and then eventually someone's going to look and go, why am I paying you? And you don't ever want that question asked about you because they already have the answer in their head. <laughs> and you're going to feel the pain of that answer. You want them to say, Wow, this guy's so involved. This guy's really contributing. Is he? I can't lose this yeah. person. Yeah. Like, this yeah. person is not necessary. And, and I, I was in GE in the day when they really went through uh, uh, downsizing incredibly. It was every 25% every yeah. quarter. And it was, it was just unbelievable. Um, and, and I saw so many colleagues be affected by that. And I say, you know, they do this thing called peer reviews. And they look and they rank you. And when they want to get rid of someone... Whether they think it's the right thing or not, somebody up there said, get rid of someone. And they have no choice. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be that someone. You want to be up here on the peer review because if you're here, you may not be there on Monday. Okay. Is there is there a way to bring, I mean, because those stakes sound awfully high. Is there, are, can a, a, an instructor replicate that kind of, I mean, other than simply just a, a poor grade? We but, do, well, actually, because how, how do you, how do you figure that out? And one of the things that, that I know Mike and I have taken from the um, IT problem solving course is mm -hmm. every pro pro IT problem solving is problem based. And some of those problem based projects are group projects. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the group project, 
they evaluate each other. There's a rubric, there's a very mm-hmm. specific rubric that says this person contributed, you know, did all the research and actually reported it out, or this person never actually looked anything up, or this person never showed up. Um, and there's like five or six different yeah. metrics that, that you they get measured on. So they get like total of 20 points if they get all of them. Um, and they grade each other. So uh, if we were all to grade each other, we would all have four. So, um, because you get to grade yourself so, because, you know, how did I think I did? You know? But <laughs> right, that's also no, reflective. I mean, you know, yeah. some people are really hard on themselves yeah. and some people, you know, and, and I said, and I tell them, I say, you need to understand that this will weight your group project grade for you. It's an individual grade that goes in addition to it. So your group project may be an A, mm-hmm. but nobody wants to give the person who never showed up for anything that A. They, right. they, they don't deserve that A. And you know they don't deserve that A. I know they don't deserve that A, but I don't know that they didn't show up because I'm not going to group, group meetings. Right. So this is your opportunity. And it takes them a while to trust that in fact you do that, mm-hmm. that in fact you, you actually do influence their grade that way. Mm-hmm. Um, but it starts to hold everybody much more accountable for the process and they trust the process a lot more because they know that the guy who isn't showing up or the girl who isn't showing up is not going to get the A that everybody else really wants. Yeah, and that's, that's remarkable, the trust thing. I like that because I was going to ask is, you know, what is how uh, do you get pushback from that kind of thing? Because it's such a not a school-like thing to do in many ways or at least not a traditional I, the way. students usually like it. It's a fairness issue. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I explained to them, I said, if, you know, I'm not doing this to you because I'm a professor and you're a student. I said, this is done to me too. I serve in committees here at the school. Hmm. And if I don't show up, I'm going to get a performance appraisal. It's not going to be a good one. I don't have the opportunity to just say, ah, I don't need to go to that meeting. I'm too important. I'm too busy. <laughs> I have to serve that. I said, and, and I've got a dean that looks at that, and I've got a provost that looks at that, and I've got a president that will look at that. And go, it's part of the job. You have to do it. Even if you say, well, that's warm. Oh, God, I'd rather be out on the boat or something. <laughs> you, you can't. And it, success is about sacrifice. And you have to be willing to engage that sacrifice and work it to your advantage, or else you're going to end up on the outside. Is um, talking about the employers. Uh, I think, Liz, you mentioned employer feedback. Mm-hmm. What kind of what kind of stuff are you guys doing in terms of talking to the big, you know, the big world out there? Like, what have, what how, how do you communicate with employers, and what are tough. they? It's tough. It's tough. We have an employment um, liaison in in each of our groups, um, which helps a little bit. But for me, it's particularly tough because I'm new to Boston, so I don't have okay. as many connections up here as I do back home. Um, but where possible, last night I went to a meetup, um, so I got, I got to meet some people who are, who are active in the industry right now mm-hmm. in the Boston area. And like a meetup, uh, like meetup. Um, Android, and, and Android meetup, yeah, yeah right, meetup.com okay. meetup, okay. yes. <laughs> um, and so our employment person said, you know, hey, it's about the only one that happens on a Thursday night. I know you're not teaching on Thursday night. Please. <laughs> um, so we went over there. And it was great to meet other people. There was one other person who was teaching anything. He teaches one semester of Swift. And they're like, you teach a whole program? Wow. And, you know, what can, what can we expect from your students? And, you know, you're not Harvard. Um, but, you know, because the other guy was Harvard. And I'm like, no, we're not Harvard Extension School, by the way. And we have a full certificate program. And that means they have taken five courses or six courses by the time they get out of this. And then we'll have a follow-on. And then we'll have an AA. And they're like, you mean they, like, really know really how to do this? I'm like, yeah, they really will know how to do this. And this is what, you know, but you tell us what you need them to know. So that we can make sure that we're teaching in the area that you want, and so that was, you know, so so that kind of feedback is really important. Yeah. Um, so starting out, I, when I started the course, mm-hmm. the company Gen Associates, uh, data ana- uh, they do healthcare data analytics. Uh, met with them, um, and I met with a few other people in industry. Uh, one of the professors here is actually a data scientist. So found out what they wanted in terms of uh, students coming out of Bunker Hill and 
set up kind of different levels of students. So the first level, the data management is basically a, someone that will do a junior database, um, junior database analyst, someone that can go in there and basically know how a database works and run. Um, for the second level, it's more in depth where it's taking off and alleviating a lot of the burden um, in terms of the PhDs and the masters in statistics guys that need to crunch data and they're spending 80% of their time just cleaning the data. Mm -hmm. So I've been trying to get the word out uh, for the program. Uh, I went to, I've been doing two, did two presentations, uh, one down in DC, one in Phoenix. Uh, I just gave a presentation at the Boston chapter of the American Statistical Association. Um, Next Friday, a meeting with the head of data science, um, data science IT in Massachusetts, uh, Holly St. Clair, and we're looking at trying to funnel some of our students into the state um, to work for her. So we've it, it's, it's been a process. It's still going to be an ongoing process. The problem is there's a stigma associated with community college when you're talking about, about data science. Well, so, sure. yeah, so yeah, so you have... You have people that have their MS and PhDs making one hundred twenty, hundred thirty thousand dollars a year, and they think that, okay, I need to have someone on my level. Um, once I get the information out about what we're trying to do, positioning the students, mm -hmm. now it's starting to open their eyes up because, oh, they're just going to be cleaning the data for me, and I get to do the fun analyst stuff. <laughs> so, we've had some really good um, feedback in terms of industry so far. Um, this is the first semester of the of the certificate. We have, I think, five enrolled right now. Um, no one's completed the certificate yet, so I'm hoping that by the time they complete it, we're going to start to be placing people in industry. But it's definitely been a process. Most of our success, successes are in the students going on to a four-year school. Uh, we send them out to Becca, which is up most of Mass, and they're number nine in the country in gaming. Um, we've been very successful in that regard, and a lot of those kids have come out of there and have great careers now uh, out in the gaming industry and doing different things. I have one guy, um, Bill Parker, and he's actually now an adjunct back at Becker, um, extremely talented, a very talented kid, but he's not doing anything in game. He's doing character design because that's his skill. That's what he can do, but he's not, you know firing rockets and blowing up bombs. He's just designing these really cool characters that you'll see in games someplace that somebody else is going to use. Do you have a, because uh, that was going to be, you know, to close things out, I was going to ask, is, is there a super, is there a superstar that kind of jumps to mind like someone, someone like Phil Park? Well, it, again, brand new programs. So. Sure, yeah, I know, I know. Again, within reason. We've only been doing this for a year. Sure, sure. Uh, <laughs> Say Bill yeah. Gates. <laughs> hey, Bill, Steve Jobs, yeah. man. Uh, Steve Jobs, man. <laughs> Um, and I'm like, no. um, some of the change, like, the, but the changes change. I've got students that have taken that have been in my courses that are going on to UIC, which is a big computer science school. Um, I have students who are starting to think about how they can start their own company, um, and so it's sort of it's it's a it's a, it's a mixed bag. It's mm -hmm. a, you know I have some students who are like, yeah, this is what I really really. When I need to take more courses. I think a lot of it, a lot of the success I see in students is when you see them have that aha moment. Mm -hmm. When they go, ah, I can do this. I want to do this. I now know where I'm going to go for the rest of my life. Yeah, I've had students who were who were nursing majors who who transferred. Into, really? Yeah, yeah. In, into this because this is really more what they because they can see where the health field is and they can see that developing things to help that field go along is, is a new and open market that they want, they want to be part of. Did you, win a, did you win over a heart and mind um, in that same way? Like, <laughs> <laughs> Well, there's, there's one of my students this semester. Um, her name's Elisa, mother of three. Um, she lives up in Lawrence, and she travels an hour and a half every Wednesday night to come and take the course. Um, really good program. It's the first time she's been back to college in about six years. Mm -hmm. um, her kids, her oldest kid is now two, so she figured that was old enough to where she could come back to college. And what I'm hoping to do is she's one of the ones when I meet um, uh, with Miss St. Clair over in Boston next week is getting her a job with the state doing this type of stuff. 
So that that's my goal. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I'm going to be successful or not in doing it, but uh, I know she'd be. She's taken the rest of the courses too. So she's taken uh, next semester SQL, um, the advanced Excel. Um, so she's going to have her certificate complete by the springtime. And the idea is if I can get her in there while she's even completing the certificate, um, then I'll have, I'll have felt like it's a success. Um, especially because she's someone that's trying to improve herself and working hard to do it. Um, that a lot of the students that we find here are people who are working full-time jobs with families and they're still coming back to get an education. Um, Something special, I think, about Bunker Hill is there's a lot of students that do that and a lot of people that are really trying hard to learn. Um, and because of that, um, it's one of the great places to teach. But she's she's an example of someone that fits into that fits into that mold. Thank you, guys. This is really cool. Thank cool. you. Thank you. Right on.